Hello, and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. This is our final university forum of 2021. I'm Myra Finkelstein. And I'm an adjunct professor in the microbiology and environmental toxicology department at UCSC, and I will be your moderator tonight. The UCSC for University Forum is an ongoing series focusing on the relevance of our research to the community and to social, economic, environmental, and political issues, proudly featuring the impact of research conducted at UC Santa Cruz. Before we begin, I have a little bit of housekeeping details to talk to you about. We are using a webinar tool, so there is no chat function. We will have an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the program. And we invite you to submit your questions into the Q&A box at any time. And tonight's event will be recorded. The Predatory Bird Research Group at UC Santa Cruz is best known for its legendary work in restoring the peregrine falcon to initiatives on the, um, to the wild. And they continue to, to conduct research, conservation, and pr promote initiatives on the Central Coast. Tonight, the group's director, Zika Glucks, will introduce a new program that aims to recruit predatory birds to forage on an earthen levee system heavily impacted by burrowing rodents. So I'd like to welcome your, our, our speakers today. Um, and it's my sincere honor and pleasure to introduce Zika Glux. Zika grew up in the Redwood Forest outside of Santa Cruz and actually started her career um, at UC Santa Cruz um, working in the toxicology department as an undergrad researcher. There she went out and did work at sea, looking at trace metals and water and other samples, then went to UC Davis for her undergraduate degree and got a degree in environmental biology and management where she did other field-based work. After getting her bachelor's of science, she went on to volunteer and work for many nonprofit bird research groups, one of them, the Predatory Bird Research Group, um, and after that, I guess she decided she wanted to venture into the California condor world, and she started working for the California condor recovery program, and she was a key um, person there that helped and is still helping to restore the California condor. She decided for some reason to come back to graduate school, and she actually was my um, postdoctoral student back at UC Santa Cruz in the microbiology and environmental toxicology department, where she looked at the um, effects of contaminants on sublethal effects of contaminants on California condor stress response. And so now today, Zika's back and she's the director of the Predatory Bird Research Group at UCSC. And so she <laughs> still goes out there and works with those peregrine falcons and puts up owl um, uh, perches <laughs> and other things. But she also still um, has her toe in the lab. I have her working with me a little bit and still looking at uh, um, trace metals and environmental samples, expect, except now a lot of uh, bird samples, such as California condor. I also want to introduce Valerie Tafoya. Valerie is um, a Doris Duke scholar. So she um, is a senior managing in biological sciences with a concentration in ecology and evolution and minoring in environmental sciences at DePaul University. Throughout her time as an undergraduate, she's ded dedicated a lot of time and effort to gain more insight and knowledge about wildlife conservation and wildlife population. As a Doris Duke scholar, she was able to contribute to the pilot study on raptors you're gonna hear about today with the Predatory Bird Research Group. And she hopes to continue to contributing to research that would be pivotal to, for the development of conservation strategies and conflict resolution. So those are our two speakers tonight. And with that, I wanna turn it over and enjoy the talk. Thank you so much, Myra. I feel very lucky to have Myra as our MC tonight um, because she really has been an inspiration for all of my work and a great mentor to have when you wanna do work that has a concrete con uh, conservation implications. Um, so thank you so much, Myra, for being here tonight. Um, so as some of you know, we're going to be talking tonight about um, owls and hawks as rodent control here in Santa Cruz County on the Pajaro River levee. Um, the data that you're going to be seeing tonight is preliminary. Uh, we haven't finished analyzing it, um, and it's unpublished. So please don't distribute it without reaching out to me first. I'm very excited to uh, 
get into this topic. It's been a fun one to share with the community. But before we get started, I just wanted to first importantly acknowledge the indigenous peoples of the Monterey Bay region that had stewarded predatory bird diversity since time immemorial. And without the incredible raptor diversity we have here in Santa Cruz County and specifically down in South, South County, we wouldn't be able to do this work. So we're very uh, indebted to them. So the project I'm talking about today um, aims to demonstrate the efficacy of raptors as a biological control of rodents um, and rodent damage on the Pajara River levee system. Um, so I already used this term raptor, don't worry. The first thing we're gonna do is talk about what is a raptor. Um, and then we'll go into the history of environmental contaminants and raptor conservation, um, specifically talk about the Pajara River and the levee system there <clears throat> and the road damage to the levee and, and management that's going on. Then we'll talk specifically about our study with raptor recruitment and experimental design. And finally, preliminary results. Then we'll get to Tafoya's, uh, Valerie Tafoya's talk as well. All right, so what is a raptor? <laughs> um, the, raptor is a very common ornithological term, but often I find um, that I lose some folks when I start talking about raptor research because of course our minds go to the velociraptor, you know, from a land before time or Jurassic Park. Um, and no, I'm not talking about dinosaurs. I'm talking about extant spe species like birds of prey and scavenger, scavenging birds, um, diurnal birds like ho um, hawks, eagles, uh, falcons, harriers, and also nocturnal species like owls and even vultures. Um, so the, the qualities that kind of make this basket term of raptor is the species should have acute, acute vision, hooked bills for tearing um, their prey, and eating their prey, and also grasping feet and sharp talons, maybe. So here's just a smattering of some of the raptor feet um, we see in this group. And yes, most of them have these powerful grasping feet with sharp talons. In fact, the word raptor is from the Latin root to grasp. So that, that's how they got their name. However, if you look at other birds like the secretary bird, like the new world vultures, they're a little more flat-footed. Their, their foots have adapted now for walking and for helping to kind of uh, tear apart carcasses. So they don't need to grasp the, that prey, but we still group them in with raptors for both taxonomical reasons, um, but also because their natural history is, there's a lot of overlap. And, and there's also a lot of overlap in the ways um, we need to work on conservation of these species as a result. So the human raptor relationship is an ancient one. Uh, raptors have been a cultural resource for um, many cultures for, <laughs> for uh, millennia um, as part of dress, ceremony, or even religion around the world. Uh, they've also been used in sport for hundreds of years, uh, specifically with hunting and falconry. And they also, to this day, are important cultural symbols. Um, you see them often as sports mascots, you know, business logos and names. Um, and this is because they still are a powerful symbol in our culture. Unfortunately, they've also, um, at times in our human raptor relationship, been labeled as varmint or competitor. Um, indeed, we do at times. Uh, have to deal with them just like with any pre predator interacting um, with livestock in ways we might not like. This is an exhibitor with a with a chicken. Uh, these things do happen. And so um, this led to some of these sort of settler beliefs that raptors were competitors. And we also see, unfortunately, um, these kinds of uh, indiscriminate raptor kills still to this day. This photo on the right is from a seizure uh, of raptor car carcasses from just a couple of years ago in Eastern York, Oregon. So this is still, this, this mindset still does persist, unfortunately. But more and more, we are realizing that um, raptors are really our partners when it comes to um, some of our endeavors like pest control and, and agriculture. And this is an example here showing a kestrel nest box in a, in a vineyard where kestrels have been shown to be really great with uh, controlling great pests. And then I really encourage uh, the audience today to take a look at the Wild Farm Alliance website, which has a bunch of awesome case studies looking at raptors, how raptors and other wildlife help um, farms succeed. 
So unfortunately, specifically um, for raptors and um, so the predatory and scavenging birds, they can be specifically vulnerable to contaminant exposure um, through secondary poisoning. And so this isn't necessarily, um, you know, things that are directly meant to hurt raptors, but because of where they sit on the food chain, uh, they can sometimes become victims of these exposures. So one of the best known um, stories here with contaminant exposure, at least a few were around in the 20th century, <laughs> was the peregrine falcon decline and recovery. Uh, this decline began with the um, introduction of DDT as a pesticide after World War II. And it basically was a reproductive toxin for, for peregrines and, and many other predatory birds. Um, it accumulated up the food chain and uh, caused their eggs to break during incubation. So basically they had a 0% reproductive rate and the population just crashed. So with the banning of this um, compound in the US and also with conservation efforts uh, by groups like the Predatory Bird Research Group, this bird was ultimately recovered completely. In a similar story, we have the Swainson's hawk and Monocrotophos. So um, these birds were uh, winter down in the pampas of Argentina, and were, there were these massive die-offs down there on their wintering grounds. And it was discovered that this pesticide, Monocrotophos, um, is a neurotoxin and was really impacting these birds. Um, they also are insectivores, so that's why they were coming into contact with it. So thanks to some quick action, these, this, these populations have been recovering. A current uh, present day issue with uh, contaminant exposure is from lead-based ammunition and our avian scavengers. Um, specifically, you may know about the California Condor uh, Recovery Program. Um, they basically come into contact with this lead-based ammunition when they're eating from carcasses that have been shot by hunters or ranchers, you know, or anyone that's trying to control uh, pests with these uh, lead-based ammunition rounds. And when they eat those carcasses, they, they eat this toxic metal and it actually causes very high mortality rates. Um, and Myra is actually doing some work now that's showing that eagles are also victims to lead poisoning across the country from this source. And finally, but you know, these, these are not all the examples of this, unfortunately, um, our Indian vulture crisis um, that was happening in South, Southeast Asia um, was happening because of a veterinary drug. So this is just a drug that was used to treat livestock that were ailing an antibiotic, but vultures were very susceptible to it. And we'd have these massive die-offs die when sick animals that were treated with this medicine would die and become uh, prey to the vultures. So we saw as many, um, or as much of, as a 99% decline in some species. So they're slowly making recovery since this is, um, people have moved away from this drug, but it's, it's, hard to see how easy it is for raptors to become victims to this kind of um, exposure. And one of the emerging threats of this kind today is anticoagulant rodenticide exposure in raptor species. So first generation anticoagulant um, rodenticides have been around for a long time. Um, an example of them is warfarin, which you might uh, be familiar with as a human blood thinner, but basically they do just that. They cause um, rats or rodents to uh, have internal bleeding and ultimately die um, through that. So folks will set out these bait stations, such as the ones pictured below in residential areas, agricultural areas, even urban areas. Um, and the rodents will come and consume poison until they die. Unfortunately, over time, uh, rodents become more and more resistant to this uh, rodenticide. And so second generation ARs are, are invented in 1970, which are even more powerful. Um, about that time, we started to see this show up a lot in um, wild birds, these secondary poisonings. So exposure to anticoagulant rodenticides can weaken the immune system of predators, so making them more susceptible to other infections. Or it can actually, um, if the dose is high enough, cause internal hemorrhaging and death. So this is a, precisely the problem with rodenticides. Anticoagulant rodenticides are used to reduce ro rodent populations, but unfortunately, scientific study after study find that these ARs are impacting a, wild, a wide variety of wildlife as well as pets. And the dangers of rodenticide is that 
these, um, the target animals, the rodents, can develop these super lethal dose doses over time. So poisoned rats and mice return to the wild um, after they consume these poison baits, and they can take over a week to die. Even the second generation rodenticides, it takes several days. So they've got this easy food source. They're going to keep coming back to the bait station in that time and, and just many times the lethal dose. So when they're weakened from internal bleeding, maybe they're less wary, maybe they're out in the open at times they shouldn't be, these poison rodents become a toxic ticking time bomb for any animal that preys on them. And the thing about raptors is that they are actually our natural, you know, our natural rodent control. Um, and so what perhaps we should be asking ourselves, oh, we'll get to that in the next slide, but yeah, so hawks, owls, and even some non-raptors like the great blue heron that we have along our Pahar River eat rodents. And we know, for instance, just as an example, one red-shouldered hawk can consume 30 rodents in a month. Um, so how do we get them to work for us? This is a great service that they're providing. It would take us a lot of time and energy to <laughs> uh, do this ourselves. So how can we help them help us? Well, one way is to protect rodent predator predators. Um, and indeed, anticoagulant rodenticides have been increasingly regulated, especially in our area. So in 2015, the EPA ruled that second generation anticoagulants could no longer be sold in retail stores to consumers like you and I um, because of the toxic danger to children, pets, and wildlife. However, professional pest control companies are still allowed to use second generation um, rodent uh, anticoagulant rodenticides. And um, since you know, they are a large part of the use in our country, it comes as no surprise that detectable levels of these second gen ARs do not decline in wild species over this time, unfortunately. So in California, just in 20, back in 2020, um, we, uh, our governor signed into law a moratorium on most uses of second generation anticoagulants, even by professionals, until reevaluated for ecological harm. So this is a temporary ban. Um, the exemptions, however, <laughs> include wineries, breweries, we've got a lot of those in California, warehouses, agricultural buildings, and more. So while they're not used as widely, they still are in the environment. And I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Raptors Are the Solution, who are an education outreach org organization that have done a lot of work to educate um, both the California community and also legislature, the legislators on the impacts of anticoagulants and also the benefits of Raptors. Um, and they are, they are based in Berkeley, California. And take a look at them. All right, so that brings us to our study. And um, so we decided to attempt to recruit raptors um, to help out with some rodent damage on the Pajara River levee. So the way this, uh, we started this project is actually thanks to Rusty Barker, who directs the Zone 7 Flood Control and Water Conservation District for the County of Santa Cruz, who actually uh, read a study that was done by a similar <laughs> district down in uh, Ventura that was starting to use raptor perches instead of anticoagulant rodenticides. And he wanted to see if there was, if he could work with our group to do something similar up here. So thanks to his ask, we got involved. So this is something that was near and dear to my heart, trying to look for anticoagulant rodenticide alternatives. So what we came up with was a two-year pilot program that uh, took place uh, 2020 to 2021, and we're just uh, starting to collect data again this year. So we wanted to investigate the effectiveness of recruiting native hawks and owls to supplement the current raptor-friendly pest management activities on the Pajaro River levees in Santa Cruz County. So this is the Pajaro River, um, a little eagle-eye view. <laughs> the, the highway you see down at the bottom is Highway 1. Um, you can tell where the river is because it's, it's a riparian habitat and we've got a lot of trees. There's that ribbon of trees that snakes through um, the screen here. And you can see that um, it's surrounded by agricultural area, but also a lot of residential area. And the Bihar River levee itself protect, protects all the surrounding farm and residential land from potential flooding. So the Bihar River itself is a 30 mile river that deposits water into our Monterey Bay. 
And the river floodplains, of course, extend far beyond the riverbed and banks. Um, in fact, it's that fertile valley that, that farmers are benefiting from, benefiting from on this floodplain. Um, so you can see on the top right, an image of before levees are installed on a river system. You can see that the river migrates in and out of the channel at the center onto the floodplain, depositing sediment. Um, but as, you know, as humans development, develop an area and we need to preserve uh, dry areas for agriculture and housing, um, often levees are placed to, to restrict the width of the river and also prevent floods and land subsidence. So here's a close up of a section of the levee. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the anatomy of the levee here. So you can see again, this cross section here with our two pyramids of levees on either side of the river. Here we've got the right slope of that um, left pyramid on the Santa Cruz County side. We call this the levee slope. And then we have the bench area. That's the flat space between the channel and the levee. So we work on both of these areas of the levee. So I might refer to them as slope and bench later in the talk. So the problem um, that Rusty came to me with was that burrowing rodents can damage the levees and increase the risk of catastrophic flooding. And this is a problem on earthen levees throughout California. So unfortunately, uh, when our rodents are doing what they do best, <laughs> make burrows in these beautiful earthen slopes, uh, they can not only just cause erosion that can lead to sloughing during flooding events and, and moving away of levee material, but they can even burrow completely through the levee, causing channels of water to make it through the levee, which is, um, and leading to levee failure. This is a pretty big problem and a, a lot of time is spent managing this problem. The species of concern in our area are the California ground squirrel, a highly social mammal that creates extensive burrows for their families. And also the bodice pocket gopher that creates burrows as part of its foraging strategy. So you see all of these little mounds as it forages through. We actually see more um, bodice pocket gopher in this area um, in our study site. The current management protocols on the Bajara River by the County of Santa Cruz is carbon monoxide ingestion, or injection, <laughs> trapping, and levee compaction. Um, so the injection is for um, asphyxiating rodents in their burrows. Trapping is just as, you, as you're familiar with, the live trap, the rodents, um, and then levee compaction to actually compact the burrows and restore the levee slope. Um, this has to be redone every year, which is pretty costly as far as um, you know, time and equipment goes. And it's also not effective at preventing future damage. It has to be redone year after year. We, I also just wanted to mention that we, we are aware that potential rodenticide use might be in use by um, neighboring landowners. There's residential areas adjacent to the study site, which are notorious for rodenticide use. And also we've seen bait stations on nearby farmland Luckily, so far, we've never seen them active. We've never found bait inside of them, but we're aware that, that they are there. So this is our study site um, from above. Basically, uh, we picked a five mile stretch on the upper reach of the Bahara River on uh, the, I guess, Western reach, the red reach, reach B. That was our control area. All of the management um, remained on both sides um, of the study area, but we didn't do any um, structure placement on, um, or any raptor recruitment efforts on this reach. But we did place some raptor recruitment structures along our raptor treatment reach, in addition to the management that's going on for flood control. So let's talk a little bit more about raptor recruitment structures. Um, one of these recruitment structures that was tried um, and, and succeeded in Ventura County um, was raptor perches. And raptor perches are great because they're pretty easy to put up and they encourage raptors to hunt in a given location. Um, the species, or six perches were placed along our two and a half mile stretch of the river. That's our raptor treatment area. And we had specific raptor species of interest for these perches. So we're looking at uh, rodent predators that are also perch hunters um, and can take rodents as big as our ground squirrels and pocket gophers. So we've got our red-tailed hawk, 
Um, this is a picture by Mark Schleicher with a rodent in talon, so very fitting. Um, then we've got our red-shouldered hawks and even our great horned owls, which we've seen a lot of use um, from them. Nest owl nest boxes are a, another great raptor recruitment structure that have been shown to be effective in um, other settings. Um, nest boxes create breeding habitat for cavity nesters like the barn owl. And we were interested in placing um, these recruitment structures, which weren't used as uh, much in the Ventura study, uh, the previous study, because we have actually more pocket gopher damage in the stretch of the le levee and barn owls are great um, gopher specialists. So we wanted to try to recruit some barn owls as well. Um, we placed six nest, nest boxes along the Pajaro River before the 2020 breeding season. And we're lucky enough to get a couple owls even at that first breeding season. Um, so a study um, by Humboldt State showed how owls can help control rodent populations and vineyards. Um, they found that in one breeding season, 20 owl boxes um, removed over 20,000 rodents um, during a breeding season. So the adults were responsible for about 155 rodents each, you know, sort of on average, if you split it up evenly, and nestlings for um, 191 rodents each. So pretty impressive if you can get a healthy population of barn owls into an area. Um, to sort of uh, follow the progress of our study, um, we collected our data through mostly GIS mapping, and I'll show some uh, screenshots of our interface in a moment. Um, the kinds of data we collected were on active rodent burrows. Um, we monitored for raptor species along um, our study area and also use of, of raptor perches, barn owl box productivity, and then also pellet collection to see what the raptors are eating. Um, and I just wanted to highlight um, that all of this work was done, with the exception of myself and Rusty, <laughs> by undergraduate students. So um, we were really lucky during the pandemic that we were able to continue this work with undergraduates since they were able to socially distance um, and continue this work. And we probably had 10 to 15 students out here over the course of these two years helping with this data collection. Yeah, so here's some screenshots of the survey one, two, three. Esri software, um, Rusty was, uh, Barker was kind enough to put this together for us and it's been a really useful tool because it runs on smartphones and just uses your internal GPS to um, import data directly into a map that's usable to create visuals right away. Um, we've got some examples of, um, you know, perch observation, uh, owl nest box observations, road and burrow observations that you can all do just with the click of your screen. And this was something that our students really took to very quickly. <laughs> They're very tech savvy in that way. So the first thing we did was conduct some active burrow surveys before the structures were placed. We did this along the entire stretch of levee. So we, we looked at the slope. We also even looked at the bench. We were looking for burrows like the one on the right that looks like there was some recent disturbance um, and was likely active. And this is the output from that first survey, just to give you an idea of the amount of data that was collected by the students um, on these box. Um, so yeah, every circle represents, uh, I, can't, I can't remember exactly the radius, but a specific radius um, that they're counting the density of burrows within. And what we can do then is sort of create a heat map um, to look at where the places of the most intense damage is. Uh, are. And we can also, we were able to place our structures strategically knowing where these hotspots were. Ultimately, what we want to get to is comparing um, between years and also between um, treatment areas to see if we're seeing any changes or differences in the road growing activity. Um, one thing, uh, we did, we did have some differences in our uh, methods between years, so it's difficult to compare them as of yet, but we'll be um, remedying that this year with a similar method to 2021. Um, but what we did notice is that we saw far fewer rodent burrows overall in, this, in the whole uh, study area, including the control, in 2021 um, from 2020. Uh, that was also, it was a drier year, and also um, it is possible that the whole reach is benefiting from our owl nest boxes. Um, I also wanted to mention, this is just a very new part of the study, but um, the zone seven flood control management program has started to map their management efforts as well. So you can see these little icons 
um, for the carbon monoxide injection, injection, as well as the trapping efforts. And I'm really excited about this um, because I think it's something uh, you know, that's relatively easy for them to do and can also help us track their, their inputs. And so we can see if there's changes in the like, economic inputs they're having to put in year to year. All right, then we have our raptor species monitoring. We had our students go out with their binoculars looking for raptors along the levee. We also, we also recorded other species that might not be, you know, our raptors, uh, our classic raptors, but might consume rodents and also might be um, vulnerable to rodenticide poisoning, just out of curiosity. We also included our, our known voracious rodent predators that we knew were present along the entire levee's um, study area, like the blue heron, the great blue heron, um, since they're going to be potentially present in the same densities throughout our study area. And as we suspected, just with the qualitative analysis, we see a really uh, robust and diverse raptor population here along the levee with plenty of the birds that we're hoping to recruit, such as the red-tailed hawk, red-shouldered hawks. Um, we've seen Cooper's hawks using our perches, and of course, <laughs> great blue herons um, throughout as well. And these are just done during the day, so we're only seeing diurnal birds here. We also have evidence that raptors are using our artificial perches. Um, the most common evidence that we find is, is raptor sign. So we're talking about um, raptor droppings and also raptor pellets that we find underneath the perches. This picture on the left is some students collecting pellets um, from the winter underneath this perch. And when we're very lucky, we actually get to see them using the perch. So this was a photo of one of our perches that actually had two red-tailed hawks on it at the same time. <laughs> It's really difficult to get photos because all these raptors have flushing dis distances. So if once you get close, they usually don't want to stick around on the perch, but um, it's really fun whenever we get to actually catch them in the act of hunting from our perches. We also monitored our owl box productivity with nest box checks using um, uh, telescoping periscope cams. Uh, also, we're lucky to partner with a permitted uh, owl chick bander um, and for, for banding as well as blood collection in 2021. And the blood collection was to see if we could monitor for rodenticides in this area. So in 2020, we were really excited to see that two out of our six boxes that we had just placed that previous November were already occupied. So clearly these, these owls are in the area and they're looking for nest sites. Um, we weren't able to confirm the number of chicks because we didn't have access to uh, the right permits for banding. But by 2021, we were able to partner with some researchers and get three out of the six boxes occupied. So it's, they're continuing to, to uh, increase on this levy system. So we'll see what we get this year. Um, we know five chicks were, produ were produced, banded. Um, and then we estimate just based on, on the Humboldt study that this could be about you know 800 or sorry 1800 rodents removed from the study site from these owls alone in 2021. Um, we did just recently get the rodenticide data back uh, from this study. Unfortunately, we or if you could read it this way, fortunately, we didn't see any traces of rodenticide in our chicks. But it seems that in the overall study that looked at barn owls and other agricultural areas in Central California, they had no hits which I think actually um, points to the idea that blood is not a great biomarker for rodenticide and living barn owls. Perhaps it has a very short half-life um, and might not be the best tool for monitoring rodenticide because we would expect to see some rodenticide in barn owls throughout Central California. But it was great that we tried it um, and we're going to continue to do our due diligence to, to try to monitor exposure rates as, as best we can. So finally, we really want to know what are the raptors eating? Are they doing their job? So we collected pellets um, from below the nest boxes and the perches. So we want to know what the, the birds that are using our structures, what, what they are contributing here. So the prey remains from these ingested pellets, which is all the like indigestible stuff. Um, owls, you get more bones than you get in diurnal raptors, but usually there's a lot of fur as well. We sort those remains and we try do our best to identify them. And then the fresh pellets we've actually been keeping to test for rodenticide, another potential biomarker for exposure, 
there's some new research going on at UC Davis to try to determine if fresh pellets can be used in this way. So um, we've analyzed 67 pellets to date, or I should say the students have analyzed 67 pellets to date. Um, and through the use of um, keys, we actually can figure out who adjusted these pellets based on pellet size and some general features um, if we're lucky. So we were able to um, identify a few, you see a couple of few slivers here that are some specific diurnal raptors, but otherwise we have some unID'd raptors and ID'd owls. But most of our pellets are actually coming from great horned owls at the perches and barn owls at the boxes. And that's that's no surprise because owls actually adjust far more pellets than diurnal raptors. And that's because they have less acidic stomachs, they consume their prey whole, so they have more bones in there, and they're just having to adjust these pellets more often. So of course we're finding more owl pellets. And then we go through these pellets and we pull out all the um, diagnostic bones. So we get all those limb bones out to see how many animals are in the pellet. And then um, most importantly, we try to get those skull bones intact and mandibles, jaw bones, because those are what are really helpful to identifying species in most cases. Unfortunately, we don't always get that. So that's why we have a lot of these unidentified mammals that are just assorted limb bones and things. But um, we do, luckily, see that one of our most commonly identified species is the pocket gopher. And this is, if you remember, one of our problem species. Um, so we're hoping to see this trend continue as we continue to analyze the pellets. Um, as you see, we are also getting some assorted rat and mouse species. Um, microtus or um, vole species are relatively common as well. And then some other fun things that pop up, like we found uh, fish or reptile scales. Sometimes we'll see some bird feathers in there. And quite commonly, we'll find Jerusalem cricket parts or those little potato bug things. Um, they seem to be really popular amongst the great horned owls. So this has been um, a pretty fruitful project in this regard, being able to find evidence that they're actually eating our problem species on the levee. But the big question here is where are the ground squirrels, right? That's the other species that we care about. Um, we found out pretty quickly that we weren't finding ground squirrels. And our hypothesis for this is that ground squirrels are big. And the species that are mostly using the Pahar River aren't adapted to eat them whole. So maybe a ferruginous hawk, a golden eagle. <laughs> and we were hoping maybe a big a great horned owl might be able to do this. But it's just likely that they're probably being eaten in pieces as, as a raptor would with a larger animal. And so we're not getting those identifiable bones. We have found some larger mammal bones that we want to believe are ground squirrel bones, but it's just hard to say. Um, so this isn't really a great tool for finding ground squirrel, uh, evidence of prowse, ground, ground squirrel prey. <laughs> Five times fast, all right. All right, so before I continue, I just want to, hand this off to Valerie, who actually was responsible for generating a lot of this data um, and analyzing a lot of this data. So um, it's thanks to her that we have um, this to show you tonight. So um, with that, I'll hand it off to you, Valerie. Well, thank you so much, Sika. So yes, my name is Valerie Tafoya. Um, and just a recap, and to give a little bit more of my background, I'm a first-gen Latina, and I'm from Chicago, Illinois. So this is where I grew up and where I reside in. And Chicago is known to be a very urbanized area, meaning for me is growing up with having a city life and not really having a connection to nature growing up until I reached the college level. So currently I'm at DePaul, I'm an undergrad senior, I'm majoring in bio and I'm minoring in environmental science. I'm also a Doris Duke Scholar from Cohort 2020, and I interned at Predatory Bird Research Group in the summer of 2021. Uh, cool. So my experience at Predatory Bird Research Group, I gained a lot of practical skills there. So involving data collection, a lot of bird identification, which I did not have experience at all before going to Predatory Bird going to California because growing up in Chicago, I didn't really have the opportunity to learn more about birds and actually did not know about the number of raptors residing in Chicago until I came back from this, uh, from working with Zika. And I also networked a lot in California, which was really beneficial for me because 
I learned how to not only do independent research, but also how to do collaborative, collaborative research with Sika, with other organizations, learning more about raptors and also learning how much the community cares about raptors. And I also gained skills such as art GIS, how to write a pilot study and also how to present. So overall, part of, um, the internship at Predator River Research Group expanded my horizons. It forced me out of my comfort zone. It was the first time I lived outside of Chicago and also worked outside of Chicago, which was an amazing experience. I developed a fondness for raptors. And it's actually a, a joke for me that before I came to California or I went to California to work um, with Zika, I actually was scared of birds which is really funny because I chose to like work with Zika, um, but I was willing to learn more about raptors and want to learn about them because I just feel like even though I was scared of them, they're, they're very important to the environment. So I learned more about raptor conservation efforts and these expanded my interest because it served as a reminder of how essential it is to collaborate with stakeholders such as landowners and residents that aid in urban wildlife conservation and I left the internship with a desire to explore more how to collaborate with stakeholders, especially under in under-resourced communities who have the potential to make a big difference in ecosystem health. My current future plans as of now is to graduate in June with my bachelor's in science. And my plan is to either attend graduate school, uh, I plan to attend a master's program or I would like to gain more experience doing seasonal jobs and fellowships. But overall, my goal is to work in wildlife conservation, focusing on management of wildlife that will support natural behaviors and ecosystem services, because oftentimes research focus on conflicts, but, but do not recognize the ecosystem services that these wildlife are providing. And so I would like to expand more about my research on how to better support those positive interactions that humans and wildlife are having that literature isn't, isn't really publishing about. And thank you. For, and that was a short introduction on how, who I am, how the predatory, predatory Bird Research Group has aided me in my career journey. And if you have any questions, I'm available via email on, um, as seen in the slide. Thank you, Valerie. And yeah, just a, a, a hearty recommendation if there are any researchers out here that want to work with Valerie. She's an amazing student, and very, uh, very driven. And I wish you the best as you go on this next step. Um, yeah, so Valerie is one of, of many undergrads that worked on this study. Um, and I just wanted to put a plug out there just because we really want to continue this work. It's a really unique local opportunity for undergrads to have hands-on research experience. And we've gotten some great support from our partners of the county, um, from the UCSC uh, Foundation Board, um, and from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, but if, if undergrad research opportunities like this are something that you want to support, please do consider donating online. Um, and, or you can just contact me and to see how you can help. Um, and I believe there'll be a link for this in the chat. Other ways you can help um, is really the best way to start is in your own home and in your own neighborhood. So find out if rat poisons are used in your home or neighborhood. If you see those bait stations around um, in local businesses, um, spread the word about their ecological impacts and, and help folks consider safe alternatives. And again, Raptors are the solution are a great resource for talking points and alternatives um, in this regard. So with that, I'd like to thank all of our partners and donors. Um, of course, the Zone 7 Flood Control Water and Conservation District, this wouldn't have happened if you hadn't approached us and it's been great to work with you from day one. Um, Native Animal Rescue as well have been partners from the beginning and really important for our structure placement um, and management uh, and maintenance, I should say. The Ken Norris Center for Natural History has supported several undergrads that have worked on this project. Um, and helped with our, our raptor training, giving us access to their museum of specimens to, to learn more about raptor ID. 
The Watsonville Wetlands Watch has given us opportunities to work with high school students, other K through 12 students, and we're hoping to expand this um, partnership to get some high school interns going this year. Of course, Raptors are the solution, have been a great help with our outreach. Um, and, it, and the study was made possible by the Santa Cruz County Fish and Wildlife Advisory Commission grant program, which gave us our first funding for this program, the UC, UCSC Foundation and the 30 Petals Fund. And a, and a quick shout out to our MVP, Mark Schleicher, who helped install of our first structures on the levee and has been our owl box uh, uh, keeper ever since. Um, so with that, um, as we go to questions, I just wanted to say, Thank you so much um, for learning about this project. We have several social media <laughs> ways to interact with us as well as a website down here. If you Google PBRG UCSC, you'll find us um, and I'd love to continue the conversation. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. That was such a great um, presentation, Zika and Valerie, and I loved hearing about it. I love this project. We have some great questions. Um, we have a couple of questions that are centered around the same thing, so I'm just gonna ask it together. Um, the, it has to do with the downside of recruitment. So could it be a possible that you're bringing the Raptors into your area, but taking them away from another place where maybe they would have been beneficial? So it was kind of like, the, are you just moving, like, you know, you're fixing your problem, but creating one elsewhere? And along those lines, are you then creating an overpopulation of raptors? So this whole thing about recruitment, like three different questions. So yes. bring them all in and then too many, then what happens? And then what if there's another, there's <laughs> third related to this is great. I love these. The third one around that is then what if they're eating things you don't want them to eat, like snakes or something like that? And so you're then kind of, you know, messing up the balance. So those are the kind of three questions related to the um, kind of consequences or maybe unintended effects of the recruitment. Absolutely. Yes, this question has come up a lot and um, has some, is something that we would, you know, we do consider a very important consideration. Of course, there's countless stories of human hubris trying to do ecological, um, you know, engineering. And, and of course, raptors can have an impact on an ecosystem. They're, they're apex predators. Uh, but when we are recruiting our raptors, we're really, it's, it's sort of like a micro adjustment. These are birds that are already nesting, hunting along the river levee. Um, it's a riparian area. There are trees, there are natural perches in the area. We're just adding ones that are like, you know, in the areas where there aren't trees um, so that they can, they can hunt on those levee slopes if they're perch hunters. Um, but even on that micro um, level, we certainly wouldn't want to have an impact on any endangered species. And we did check to make sure, at least in the case of barn owls, since they, they require cavities to nest, so they might not be in the area without a cavity, right? Um, that they, you know, would, they're specialized enough hunters that they're not gonna really go outside of the mammalian community that much. Um, and there were no endangered rodents in the area. So that was something that we felt comfortable with at the time um, we started the study. But it's a really good question and it's something that we're continuing to monitor through our pellet analysis as well, just to, to ensure that um, they're eating species that are, have healthy populations. And then do you worry about bringing too many in? Because some people, somebody was worried about like basically, you know, artificially creating like uh, overpopulation. Yes. Uh, yeah. So um, with the perches, I don't think that's a concern because these are birds that are already in the area. They're just using the perch they're already, this is already their foraging habitat. So it's just giving, um, I guess, improving it for the existing birds. Really what um, moderates the raptor population um, is, is prey availability. So <laughs> that, I guess the only thing we could do is maybe change prey availability and see, uh, you know, differences. And it's sort of, it, luckily with natural systems, there is that self um, adjustment that happens there with predators and prey. So I, I really don't think with the diurnal raptors, these these structures aren't like magnetic. They don't bring the hawks in. They just provide a hunting a perch for a red-tailed hawk that's already nesting along the levee. We've found three red-tailed hawk nests in trees along the levee, so they're there. <laughs> We're just giving them a perch by the levee that they can hunt on the levee slope. Um, but yeah, for the barn owls, that that could be a concern if you had. Um, as I said, if you had endangered species that you did not want to be uh, controlled by that barn owl population. And so that's something definitely to consider when you're placing barn owl boxes. 
Um, but you know, these are these are really common species already in the area. We're not introducing any species that aren't here already. Um, we're not, you know, bringing in an, an, an invasive uh, species situation. So all these rodents have evolved to be with these raptors, and these raptors have evolved to be with these rodents. Okay, and um, someone else was wondering if you're going to um, uh, expand your study to the surrounding Pajaro branches closer to housing areas because they, she, uh, the uh, questionnaire said that they notice it's just in the Agri region right now. Yeah, so we picked a we picked this region because um, it was easy for us to access, and um, you know they had a, a gopher problem specifically here. But we are, and we're really excited that we are trying to expand into some other areas. The closest area, actually, well, I won't show the map, but if you're familiar with the area, um, it's the Salsa Puertas Creek that comes off of the Pajara River, and that's a walking trail through a residential area. Um, and so we're really excited about that because it's a different kind of habitat. It's more opportunity for citizen involvement and, and high school student involvement because it's easier to access. Um, and it will be a very different kind of environment um, for the birds. So we'll see how they use these structures in that environment. Um, as far as, yeah, we there's really, this could work in many different kinds of habitats. Um, and that's why we're doing the study because, um, you know, the one study in Ventura is really promising, but it's different up here in, in Santa Cruz. We have different kinds of crops, um, you know, different uh, uh, climate patterns and all of these things. So we wanted to see if it would work in these, in our local environment. Okay, great. And then are you looking at white-tailed kites as well? Another question. Um, that's a great question. Uh, we have seen white-tailed kites um, near this site. Um, they're very specialized raptors. They really like voles. That is their main food source. Um, and as such, they're actually, uh, we haven't seen much evidence of, um, yeah, we haven't seen much evidence of them being useful in, in this context. Um, but but yeah, I, I they could potentially benefit from any, project that is moving away from anticoagulant rodenticides. So um, I hope that we benefit white-tailed kites through this work. One of my favorites. Um, okay, so a couple questions about how close can you place the owl boxes um, near each other? Um, sort of on like, can I put one like in my front house to get rid of the Norway rats like that I have or something? So people are wondering about how close you can do um, put them and whether or not you can put them in residential areas like your front yard. Yes, yes, that's a great question. So um, the, the recommendations are that they be a quarter mile apart. We play the stars half a mile apart in case we ever wanted to increase the density or add some on the other side of the river. Um, I have seen the multiple owl boxes occupied closer together if they're, you know, this, the conditions are right. There's lots of prey that are sort of faced in different directions. So you're not, they're not interacting with each other. Um, so it's really depends on your situation and, and you can always put up more than you need and hope you get one. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, they, they, they're used in residential areas. I remember when I was a student in Davis, we had a resident barn owl that lived in a palm tree above our house. So, and that was in a very suburban area. Um, and the really one thing you want to consider um, is not putting them in really heavily forested areas because those are really the domain of the great horned owl and they're really important um, barn owl predators. And so that's something we you know, we're concerned about as well, knowing that there's great horned owls around. Um, but luckily we haven't seen any evidence of predation so far. Um, but yeah, the open, more open areas are more friendly for the, for the barn owl. Um, oh, that's great. And so uh, I know I'd love to put a owl box. I can, I know, I know a guy <laughs> if anyone's interested. <laughs> so uh, someone was asking about DNA analysis of the pellets. And I just wanted to say, you know, Zika came in, she was very generous to come into an uh, undergraduate course I was teaching last quarter and brought in a bunch of pellets and the students all went in through and spent the class time, you know, peeing out these pellets. And I, you know, I couldn't tell, you know, a little leg bone from one versus the other and so uh, someone asked about DNA analysis and why not? Yeah, it's totally doable. We've been saving all of our fur and bones just in case this is something that we want to try down the road. Um, it is more costly than having our students do this work. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, it's something that we can, we can pursue, um, especially with those ground squirrel, potential ground squirrel bones. We really want to know if they're getting those, that species. Um, this is an interesting question. I do not know the answer, but uh, what about using concrete instead of dirt for the levees or some other type of material that maybe is not going to be susceptible to rodent erosion? Yeah, that's a question probably for the engineers more than myself. Um, I know that there's a lot of older levee systems that use earthen um, levees. I'm sure they're probably cheaper to put in than miles and miles of concrete um, and to maintain. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, that's why in a lot of areas you do see, especially when there's a lot of hum, human population around, you do see those, those um, concrete levee systems. But you can imagine over 30 miles, that would be a big project. Um, and also with the riparian area right nearby, there might also be some concerns with that. Um, but yeah, that would be a question for the uh, engineers. So this one I should have um, grouped together with the last question about putting up um, uh, owl box locations and things because they wanted to ask what a concern how much of a concern is if your neighbor's using rodenticide and you're trying to bring in owls so actually it seems like that could be a really big concern it is a concern yeah i, I mean i think you need to start with outreach um and i mean there is evidence that owl, owl barn owls do coexist with rodenticides they're on, they're in all the landscape that that barn owls exist in. Um, and so they do make it. However, there probably are some mortalities, you know, and some suffering associated with the rodenticides. Um, so there are great outreach um, tools you can use to um, educate folks in your neighborhood. Um, a lot of people don't realize the ecological impacts. It's just a really easy fix to put out a bait station. Um, and you don't have to deal with, uh, you know, the results of um, you know, your rodent control program. And so it's a really, uh, I, what's, you know, attractive option for folks. Um, but yeah, you know, learning the, learning the impacts can be helpful for making that switch. Um, but yeah, I, I would say you'd probably want to do a mix of outreach, um, and placement of barn owl boxes if you're going to be doing that and you know rodenticide is used next door. And we had two uh, questions about the how far the raptors go when they're hunting, and then also how large their ranges are. And so wondering whether or not your um, zones were, you know, how, how much did they stay in the zones that you wanted, but then also general kind of questions about um, how, yeah. how big are the ranges and do they overlap? Do, do you remember this uh, from your report writing, Valerie? I want to see if you want to answer any of these. Well, I do remember that it did vary depending on the species. Um, and I do remember, I don't remember the exact number. I just know that it does vary. Yeah, so it definitely varies. The core range of um, barn owls is a, a kilometer, although they will forage outside of that. Um, if, if there's really good quality, you know, habitat, they're, they're going to go straight across to that habitat, you know, over the highway or whatever to go get it, um, the prey there, but, um, yeah, roughly a kilometer. So there's certainly an, uh, a chance that there are these kind of edge effects from the barn owls being on the two and a half mile stretch, um, east of the control area. And so we're, we're considering that that is probably impacting our results, um, However, the perches are obviously very local effects, um, so we wouldn't expect to see that impacting our control area. Um, so what might end up being more useful than the control area is just the before and afters of placing the perches and boxes, yeah. Great question. Someone is wondering whether or not uh, there's been any increases in hawks and owls on the west side because they feel like they've seen a lot more in the last couple of years. That's really cool. I definitely have been hearing a lot more about raptors on uh, near the walking path in West Cliff um, because there's some very charismatic birds that have been hanging out there and I think really draw the eye. Um, and I mean, hopefully we're seeing increases in populations um, in all raptors. But I, what comes to mind is our dark morph red-tailed hawk out there that's probably the most photographed bird in Santa Cruz right now. I love them so much. I, every time I see them, it's a good day. And then ospreys have been hanging out there as well as peregrine falcons, which is very exciting because as we all know, peregrine falcons were not even in Santa Cruz just a few short decades ago. So 
Um, so yes, some as some populations recover, like the peregrine falcons, we should expect to see more in our area um, as the years go on. We had that an osprey like in front of our house on a telephone pole eating a fish, and it was like <laughs> flopping around. <laughs> like this is me. Wild Santa Cruz, yeah. <laughs> Kids were just taking so much ecstatic. I'm sure. Uh, so, kind of related to that is they were wondering if some uh, another person asked about trends and relationships between observed raptor sightings. Like, if you see one species, are you going to see the other? Hmm. Or if you see one, you definitely will not see another one, just around the same time or in the same area. That's a really interesting concept. I um, There are raptors that are associated with certain habitats. And so, yes, you know, if it for it, more forest associated hawks go hand in hand and more, you know, grassland associated hawks go hand in hand. Um, there aren't any relationships um, per se, where they kind of like have the symbiotic relationship with each other, where they kind of have to exist together. Um, the only thing that sort of comes to mind is that uh, great horned owls, they don't build their own nests. So they often will use the nests of last year's diurnal raptors, like the red-tailed hawk and the red-shouldered hawk. Um, and so what will often happen with them is that they will move in because they start breeding earlier. So they'll move in in the winter time to that nest. And then when the red-tailed hawk or red-shouldered hawk comes back, this huge gray horn owls are there and they can't use their nest anymore. <laughs> so though definitely those three species have a lot of overlap in their nesting just because the gray horn owl steals their nests. <laughs> but that's a really cool question. I haven't thought about it that way before. I'll have to think about that. Oh, Valerie, it's got it. Yeah, it actually, that question reminded me of the time. I'm not sure if you were there with us, Zika, but we did observe two red tail hawks interacting at the same time. So we did have to, we did record that. So I thought it was interesting because the fact that they have ter territories, so you would expect them to just stick with their territories. But um, overall, I mean, I remember one time when I went out there with Hannah, we did observe like uh, a blue heron probably like five minutes before we saw a red tail hawk. So we do see different species within the area, but we don't really see them interacting as much. Thanks, Valerie. Okay, so um, something about more about what they eat. Uh, will owls, great horned owls eat house cats and do raptors, can they eat bats? Yes, so this, this comes up a lot because, you know, these are big birds and they are predatory birds and they, you know, that's their job. And um, so I understand the, the concern. Um, what, what we need to remember about these birds is that they, they, they're big, but they've adapted to be like really light so that they can fly. They've got these hollow bones. They're all feathers. If you wet them down, they're like, you know, your little uh, shih tzu or something, they <laughs> get really skinny. Um, so even your big, you know, red-tailed hawk is gonna be like, you know, maybe two pounds. Um, so they can't lift, you know, a, an eight pound house cat um, even um, and take it away. Um, so you can be pretty, pretty confident that that won't happen. That being said, juvenile raptors, they don't know how their own strength yet. They don't know their limitations and they're really hungry because they're learning how to hunt. And so sometimes they'll, they'll try to go for prey that is beyond their capacity because they're just desperate. And so there, there is a potential for, for a like juvenile great horn owl attack, but they're going to really quickly see that they can't handle that, that prey size. Um, in most cases, chickens, more of a concern, um, definitely a lot of chicken depredation from hawks. That's probably the main source of predation in, in free range chickens, I would say. Well, that was sort of wondering like, you know, kind of the downsides to sort of bringing in some of these um, mm. uh, raptors to residential areas. And another um, person asked about how loud they are. Near oh, house. that is very cool. Yeah, so if anyone's had a red shouldered hawk around, they're probably familiar. <laughs> with that sound, especially during the breeding season, they're our most vocal raptor. Um, and so at times they can be loud, but it, as a rule, 
raptors aren't super vocal. Um, they'll only call for territorial reasons um, and maybe do some, some quieter calls for the communication with their partner and things like that. Um, so, you know, the tradition or the uh, famous red-tailed hawk, like, <laughs> it's few and far between for the most part. Um, what about but yeah. owls, owls though? I think they're Oh, owls. yes. Oh, right. For owls. Okay. So barn owls can be a thing. They kind of <laughs> sound like a screaming banshee. They're not calling all the time, but it can be pretty unnerving <laughs> when you hear it for the first time. It's a little uh, spooky. Um, great horn owls, we have them around my house, and I really like the sound of a great horn owl. Very low decibel kind of, um, you know, bass sound, but um, yeah, to each their own. What do you think, Valerie? Yeah, actually, when I was um, living at the UC Santa Cruz apartments, um, there was a great horn owl that was actually perched outside because um, I was within the redwoods. And so it was really interesting to hear it. It was kind of eerie at first because the doors were shut. And so I did hear them, but at the same time, it was like 11 p.m. So it was very quiet. And so, but at the same time, it's not continuous. So it was very much just like a one minute thing where and then after that, I just didn't hear it again. Well, I have there. Oh, okay. I was just gonna say, they're not like the mockingbird outside your window at 5 a.m. situation. <laughs> Well, there's someone that has a specific question for Valerie and um, wants to know, Valerie, if you have some suggestions for encouraging young people's interest in them. raptors. Well, well, like I mentioned in my in my slides, is I actually personally didn't have an interest in raptors. I just thought, you know, I my goal was to learn more about, about human and wildlife interactions. So even if people don't have an interest with raptors. I do encourage people to join in these programs because they will learn more about these interactions. And in this specific um, nonprofit, you get to learn more, they get to learn more about both conflicts and also the positive interactions. In this case, the positive interactions is raptors preying on rodents, which is great for us because we have less rodents that would cause less damage. Um, the negative interactions being that the rodents cause levy damage. And so I think the best way to encourage people is just informing them, informing them how great and beneficial this experience could be. Um, and even if it doesn't perfectly align with their interests, there is a lot of benefits to just pursuing different opportunities because you never know what you could gain out of it. Now, I hope that kind of answers your question. <laughs> That's great. Myra, you have a couple of young enthusiasts. Oh, <laughs> What's your secret? <laughs> I don't know. My kids, they, yeah, they're, they're a bird. <laughs> um, it depends on this sort of segues into somebody's asking if you're currently recruiting intern, interns to continue work on this project or other projects with the predatory bird research group yes um so we love interns we <laughs> i love interns one of my favorite parts of my job is working with students and um i think it's one of the most important things we do is training the next generation of conservation biologists um, and so we have our crew for 2021. Um, we have a great crew of four students that are going to be working this spring. But if we can continue this project, we'd love to have more students in 2022. Um, we've got some opportunities in our Peregrine Falcon Monitoring Program for students to participate. Um, so that is looking at breeding Peregrine Falcon um, behaviors either through a cam or in person. Um, and there's probably still some time to jump in on that. That season's just starting. Um, but in general, in future years, we'd love to hear from students that are interested in that. Um, I do like to, as much as I can, um, either give students credit or pay them for their work. So it's, it's usually um, based on my ability to fundraise for those students. Yeah, that kind of um, is another, which is related to this other comment we had and question about funding research projects student research projects, if this was a great way to make projects like this available to students. And as you had just mentioned, um, Zeke and I both feel like a barrier for bringing undergrads in is um, the, the fact that there's no support for a lot of research projects for them. So turn that back over to Zika. 
Yeah. So, it, I mean, as you saw in, in Myra's great intro, you know, undergraduate research was really important to my, um, you know, career path. And I, I think it's really important. And increasingly, this, you know, this field is very competitive. So as much as you can graduate with some experience, you're really setting yourself up for a better chance of getting a job out of, out of college. Um, and so while we encourage students to take on these, these positions, it can be really difficult if they need to also support themselves outside of school. Um, and so I think it's important that as much as possible, researchers try to reimburse students for their time um, so that they're able to support themselves through school and gain experience instead of only offering these opportunities to students that can afford to volunteer for credit. So um, it's an important part of diversifying our field um, and getting more perspectives and, and you know, the best and brightest, uh, you know, becoming conservation leaders. And so it's a little thing. It seems like a little thing paying a student for versus giving them credit, but it actually has a big impact on our field as, as we move forward. Yeah, I think it's a huge way that we can really help increase uh, the diversity of students, you know, getting research experience at the university level. Um, Someone, and I'm interested in this too, did the Ventura study that you were talking about earlier, has it led to any management change or anything like that? Their study was amazing. It was a wild success. Do you want to answer to Valerie? Yeah, so I actually do remember a bit about um, their study. So I do know that they did end up having savings, I believe around like 8,000 because they were using road, um, avian rodent control instead of rodenticides. Um, but I do want to know that there was like differences between our study and their study. I don't remember the exact um, differences, if you recall, Zika. Yeah, so they, they were had more of a ground squirrel problem, and they were using rodenticides to manage that problem, which required them to um, hire a pest management agency. Um, and so what they did was instead of, once they realized the purchase were preventing, were, um, were basically as effective as the rodenticides and much, much cheaper because they didn't need to have someone out there, you know, trapping and applying rodenticides all the time. Um, they actually hired on um, those pest uh, control folks to um, fill in the ground squirrel holes with um, like this sort of concrete sediment thing um, and just sort of like monitor the purchase. And it, it really saved them a lot of money and they were able to completely go off rodenticides for a lot of these study areas um, just from raptor purchase. Um, so yeah, so it was a really, really great example of how this can work. Um, and, and it's really, really powerful when these studies are initiated by the flood control, um, you know, agencies themselves, just like the study we have here. So all the data that we're generating is going directly into the management decision making for the, by the county. Um, so it's just awesome to have these direct partnerships so that can, we can ensure that there are potential, um, you know, conservation outcomes that will benefit raptors. That's just so exciting in the, to think about that. Um, so uh, Mark chimed in and said concrete would not be permittable if we're thinking about other options and it would also be too expensive. So that's that is likely. And so let's see. So we have another question, which is basically besides the fact that it's hard to find those ground squirrel bones, is there like do you have another like is there another reason or is do you think something else could be happening with the ground squirrel? Like why? Yeah, it's possible. It's not a huge issue in our reach, so there might. Uh, but there's certainly, you know, in the near environs, there are ground squirrels. We know just on the Salsa Puedes Creek um, across the highway, there are extensive ground squirrel burrows. <laughs> um, it's possible that they're choosing not to to eat them. Um, the, the raptors that we've recruited to these structures, so they have enough food where they're at, they don't need to go find those ground squirrels. Um, there's really endless hypotheses for why we're not seeing them um, that I, yeah, I could have included. So thank you for bringing this up. Um, but yeah, we we think we might, we, we just think we might be seeing some remains. So we, I just don't wanna rule out the fact that these birds might be also eating ground squirrels. And as we expand the study to Salsa Cuedes, which is a ground squirrel central, 
maybe we'll get some more insight into what's going on here on the Pajaro. You know, I think we're running, wrapping up the list of questions. I hope I've, I have tried to consolidate some of them. Um, someone else also mentioned that there are um, harvest mice, you know, which are endangered. Um, and many areas are endangered, so that could be an issue, but you did talk about the fact that you were um, kind of researching the consequences of bringing in these um, raptors and that you checked to make sure there was no endangered mammals in your area. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants to know what all our favorite, rap favorite raptors are, so. Uh, <laughs> it's hard so to pick. Hard. I hard. Valerie, Valerie, you go yeah, Valerie, can you start? Do you have a favorite? Uh, I think, it would be the osprey for me, just because I did not see them as often. I, only, I literally only saw it once, and it was interesting because I was actually walking on campus, which is the Redwoods, Redwoods Apartments, and I saw it above um, the trees. So was just, I thought it was crazy. Um, I did want to go explore their nest, so hopefully I could do that in the future. But I think they're my favorite just because like how mysterious they are <laughs> to me right now. <laughs> I totally get that. Um, yeah, so I have a lot of, um, a lot of favorites. I have favorites for different like regions of California, um, that I get excited about, but I think, okay, oh, this is so hard. If you asked me on my last hike with students, what my favorite raptor is, it would probably be the American kestrel. Cause I get really excited about American kestrels. They're just so bright and beautiful and cute and, vicious um and they're they're our littlest falcon so i'll say american kestrel today do i not have to pick favorite i i i don't do well with that i do like merlin so oh yeah pretty cool and then you know i work with california condors so they're always going to be near and dear but um, um mark wanted to comment that bobcats and coyotes could be eating the ground squirrels they could. And, and the thing that's great about utilizing um, or just trying to move away from anticoagulants is that you're benefiting all of these other rodent predators. Um, we have seen evidence of rodenticized exposure um, with a bobcat on the Pajara River. I was just pretty sad to see it had a very um, advanced uh, case of mange, which we know is um, usually associated with rodenticide exposure since it weakens their immune systems. So we do see that there's these effects on these really important rodent predators that live in this area. And we wanna, as much as we can, move to these sort of integrated pest management solutions that help all of our predators and scavengers, yeah. And we have seen coyotes too on the Fajara, which is recently with the students, it was very exciting. Okay, I think, I think that's all of them. <laughs> I hope, Good I hope guys. <laughs> if, I, if I have uh, mangled your question or not consolidated in a way beyond recognition, but um, I do thank you for your questions. These were great questions. And thank you, Valerie and Zika. And it was uh, such an honor to be your moderator tonight. Such a great project, such an amazing organization. Love the Predatory Bird Research Group. We're so proud to have this at UC Santa Cruz. Just such a flagship conservation you know, organization. And, and I'm so glad you're the director now. Thank you, Myra. Thank you for being here tonight. And thank you, Valerie, for all the work you did on this project and for being here tonight as well. Yes, thank you for inviting me for, to this. Cool. All right, well, I, have, I hope everybody has a great night.